Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those who may be on the East Coast. Uh, first off, I do just want to mention that the session is being recorded and may be used for future marketing purposes. Uh, thank you for joining our Teletalk on Digital Identity for Seamless Onboarding. My name is Tyler McLaughlin. I'm our event manager at Telesign. Uh, and Teletalk is a live digital video content series produced by Telesign, bringing industry-leading knowledge direct to your home office. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Zoom at this point, but a few basics before we get started. During the session, we will communicate with the attendees using polls and Q&A. Uh, the polls will automatically appear on your screen. I'm going to send one to you actually right now. So you should see how that pops up. This is just a welcome poll with a few uh, preliminary questions to gain feedback for everyone. Uh, so when you see these pop up on your screen, please just answer those questions. Um, and then uh, if you've got any questions throughout, you can use the Q&A function to submit those questions to us. And we may pose them to the speakers at the end for discussion. Uh, the agenda for today will involve about 30 minutes for discussion, which will include this brief introduction and then another 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, jumping right in, today we are joined by Stacy Stubblefield, Telescience co-founder and chief innovation officer, who will be moderating the session. Stacy, you want to say hi to the group? Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here today. I'm one of the co-founders of Telesign, as Tyler mentioned. Um, I'm currently the CIO. Have been working for the past 15 years with a bunch of our um, major clients and helping them solve their problems. Great. Uh, and we're also joined by Ravish Patel, Telesign's Senior Director of Digital Identity Solutions, who will be our topic expert for the discussion. Ravish, you want to say hi to the group? Hello, everyone. Uh, really looking forward to this webinar. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, I take care of the digital identity solutions at Telesign and have been working in the space of uh, fraud and, and say frauds uh, for around 15 years or more. Great. Oh, well, let's get started. I'll pass this uh, digital mic over to Stacy, who will begin with a brief history of Telesign. Awesome, thank you so much, Tyler. So just to jump right in, give a little bit of background about Telesign. Uh, we were founded back in 2005, um, and we started by focusing on two-factor authentication. And so for anyone who doesn't know what two-factor authentication is, um, it is when you send a text message or a voice call containing a PIN code um, uh, to sign on to an account, right? So most of you, probably all of you have been through this before. When you're trying to log in somewhere, you have to get a pin code to go ahead and complete uh, the login. And obviously the reason for that is to fully secure your account. Um, we spent a lot of time working with uh, huge clients, sort of convincing them that phone number made sense as a primary identifier for accounts online. Um, and, uh, and we're now helping them further secure their accounts with data as well. Um, we work with 21 of the top 25 web properties globally. Um, we're processing more than 1 billion transactions a month, so uh, 15 billion transactions a year. And um, we you know, work across 200 countries. Evolution of Telescience. So as I mentioned, we started in 2005. Um, in 2017, we were acquired by a company called Bix. Um, they're, they're probably one of the biggest companies that you have used but never heard of. Um, they carry a lot of the global um, voice and roaming traffic. Uh, and we work with them very closely now to enhance our offerings. Um, and to, um, you know, to globally source additional data, um, specifically identity data, which is what we're going to be talking about with Ravish today. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're talking today about onboarding new users. Um, in the real world, it's pretty simple to bring on a new uh, customer, right? You just, uh, you know, as a user, as a new customer, you walk into um, into a business, you show them your identity documents, whatever they happen to be, maybe it's a passport, maybe it's a utility bill, whatever, whatever it is, and you get your new account. Ravish, can you tell us a little bit, how does this work online? It sounds like it's probably quite a bit more complicated. Yes, thank you, sure. Um, so again, as you mentioned in the physical world, uh, it's just probably very easy to create an account because you're physically present and any service that wants to 
help you create an account, can physically verify you, look at you, look at your documents, and, and it becomes easier. But having said that, as you move towards the online world, uh, it becomes much more difficult with the layer of anonymity that you have on internet. Right? So, I mean, imagine uh, yourself uh, creating an account on any mobile app or uh, a web app or any service online, basically. You would provide your name, address, maybe because that's unique to you. You could provide your email or phone number, which is also unique to you probably, but then you could have multiple emails associated and, and which you might be using for the last 10 years. You could open an account from multiple devices, your iPad, your phone, your uh, laptop, and, and, and that makes it again uh, difficult for the service to kind of verify you every time you communicate with them through different channels as well. You could create an account from your home, you could create an account from your office, you could use a public Wi-Fi while you're on a move to create an account, right? So. All of this uh, makes uh, digital identity, which is your identity online, a little more complex than uh, what we feel. And uh, basically, uh, wherever there is complexity, obviously there are loopholes and, and fraudsters try and uh, uh, identify those loopholes and take advantage of that. And, and this is what we want to avoid. Uh, just to give you a personal example, uh, I moved from uh, Europe to US two years back. And um, when I moved, I mean, the first thing that I was looking for is a rental apartment. And, and uh, I checked many classified websites. I checked many uh, rental apps, et cetera. And I was amazed to see and, and uh, find the uh, amount of fake listings on, on, on these classified websites. So it was very, um, I mean, eye-opening for me as well at that point of time. So basically this anonymity online uh, creates a vacuum of trust on and uh, for various services to kind of trust you online. And then throughout this webinar, basically we'll try to understand how we can bridge that uh, trust gap. Yeah, fraudsters are really, really good at finding any sort of gap, any kind of hole where they can, uh, you know, take advantage. That's, <laughs> you plug one hole and then they pop up in another one, right? They're, they're really good at that. So, you know, as you were talking about, it's really, really hard to tell who's signing up, if they're a good user, if they're a bad user. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what fraudsters are up to, the types of fraud they're doing and some of the uh, methods that they're using? Sure. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about uh, catching fraudsters at the top of the funnel when they are creating account, basically their purpose is to create bulk accounts, which they could resell in the market uh, for various purposes. Uh, uh, in order to kind of get fake followers, fake influencers uh, out there. Uh, but I mean, one of the striking examples that you see on, on, on this slide right now is the ghost, right? So that's uh, a ghost driver uh, 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 proposing a ghost ride uh, on, on one of the uh, ride sharing applications. And then, and, and, I mean, as you could imagine, uh, I mean, imagine yourself creating uh, or, or uh, taking a ride in a new city or a new country and, and you get uh, a rider like that waiting for you. Would you take that ride? <laughs> I mean, no. I personally wouldn't want to show up for that. And can you tell us a little bit, why do they use those ghost faces? It's such a weird thing. Because uh, the business model is to kind of make money out of cancellation fees. As soon as you see that picture, uh, you're going to cancel that ride. They're going to get cancellation fees. And that's how they make money. And, and of course, in order to scale that business, what they need to do is create as many accounts as possible, as many fake accounts as possible, and put as many ghost pictures as possible. And, and that kind of scales their business over a period of time. So, I mean, this is just an example of how bulk accounts could be used to uh, damage uh, or, or, or create fraud uh, on, on, on such a ride share platform. Uh, but, uh, I mean, again, uh, there are ways to scale bulk account creations. There are uh, SIM farms uh, available in, in many markets where you can basically host uh, 1,000, 10,000 SIM cards and phones and, and uh, run an operation over a period of time to kind of create multiple bulk accounts. That's how you might be seeing uh, various ads online where you could buy fake uh, uh, followers on Instagram or fake followers on Facebook. Basically, these operations are run out of these SIM farms. And, also in many developing markets uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and in, in, for example, in India and in Western Africa, there are even users who are actually uh, creating multiple accounts and, and reselling those accounts as well, right? So uh, it's, it's a pyramid scheme at the end of the day and that can be used to uh, create promo abuses, spam accounts, fake reviews on, on, on marketplaces, et cetera. It's not only limited to um, uh, uh, these frauds, uh, as well, but um, 
again, there's also a notion of financial crime or, or money laundering involved as well. Like imagine uh, you want to transfer a million dollars uh, to Russia, for example, right? Uh, and what you would do is uh, book uh, 50 apartments on a home rental service, transfer the money, but you never go and stay there, right? So it, it's also, as, as these uh, marketplaces are becoming more and more global, uh, it's easier for uh, uh, processors to use them to transfer money and, and, and use that money for bad purposes and for, for terrorism, et cetera, as well. And again, uh, content abuse is uh, becoming very uh, critical, uh, especially with uh, the global uh, events like pandemics happening right now. Uh, I mean, you would see many fake mass sellers uh, creating fake contents uh, in order to kind of sell more of their products and services online, right? So um, there are different kind of ways uh, through which processors can abuse bulk account uh, and, and, and on various platforms. Uh, but it all starts by creating multiple accounts uh, on, on these platforms and then uh, uh, use various approaches to kind of monetize them. Yeah, totally. It makes sense. Uh, it sounds like it's a big business uh, fraud actually in the, in the, you know, in basically the underworld, the other side of business, right? Um, so how big is this problem really? Is it having much effect online? Is it really that big of a problem? Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, some of the news that are coming out in the last few years around fake news uh, on, 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 on multiple uh, social media platforms, I mean, you can, you can literally see uh, all of that originating from fake accounts that are being created, right? So uh, many of those social media companies have now started to take action because the problem is too big on their side. Uh, as you can see, almost 2.5 uh, times, uh, let's say, fake accounts versus legitimate accounts on, on some of those platforms. And, and they have uh, taken actions to kind of stop billions of uh, fake accounts that have uh, been created on their platform for the last many years and which is kind of uh, affecting their platform because the content at the end of the day on their platform is no more genuine uh, the reviews that are coming on their platforms are no more genuine and, and uh, it, it uh, affects the way they monetize their own business as well so it's huge uh, and and uh, we see this on a daily basis on a massive scale as well uh, I mean, uh, as you mentioned, we work with uh, some of the largest websites and, and uh, properties around there in the world. And, and we see billions of uh, fake accounts are, be, are maybe attempted on, on uh, many of those websites and, and at a global scale uh, and on multiple markets. Yeah, it's interesting. I started, I've started to see companies that actually will go through um, the uh, review section on certain websites and tell you how likely the reviews are to be legitimate versus to be, you know, posted by the company that actually posted the product, right? So, um, you know, there, <laughs> there's, there's a big enough problem there that these types of, uh, these types of companies have been created. Absolutely. I mean, this is an example of uh, over a billion attacks that we have seen on our platform last year uh, through, um, uh, on, on, on various uh, websites and applications that, that we work with, right? So you can see uh, those accounts originating from uh, many of the large countries. So US, China, and Russia are amongst the top three. But then you also see countries like Cambodia, for example, which is actually uh, one of the hubs of SIM farms in Southeast Asia. Uh, and a lot of fake account creation happens through, through the, those countries. And of course, uh, you cannot ignore uh, our Nigerian prince as well. Uh, you see a lot of that coming from Nigeria and, and many other countries. So overall, I mean, just want to emphasize again, I mean, it's, it's a global problem. It's a massive problem. And, and, and the reason it is very difficult to prevent is uh, it's uh, happening through, through many uh, channels uh, and, and through so many countries as well. So, I mean, imagine uh, a, a startup uh, which is uh, starting operations in the US market is successful. And, and wants to scale up their business over the next few years uh, um, into various countries. And, and uh, one of the challenges that they will see, obviously, is uh, uh, managing these attacks at a global level. If it's one country, it's easier to manage. If it is 200 countries, it's, it becomes much more complex to manage. Yeah, absolutely. And it is really interesting to think about because a lot of the companies that we are helping are giant, you know, internet properties that everybody has heard of and have billions of users. I, and, and even they're having issues, right? I can only imagine being a startup or a smaller company trying to deal with this type of issue. It, it would be nearly impossible to handle. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, solving uh, these challenges is not easy, obviously, but um, 
just just starting uh, with a generalized view of how uh, customers could uh, look at these problems and and try and protect themselves from uh, these fake users and fraudsters onboarding their uh, onboarding their platforms right so um starting uh, as a very simple step uh, if they are able to ver- validate identity of users uh, when they are creating accounts on their platform which means uh, when you say validation uh, uh, imagine uh, you are collecting a phone number uh, you are collecting an email or or a name and address of the user when you are onboarding uh, let's say that user on your platform is this a real identity or or, or just a mickey mouse right are our fraudsters just able to create an account by just typing mickey mouse or or typing a fake phone number which never existed uh, with with a carrier online right so that's the first step uh, that that uh, is is useful in order to uh, weed out these uh, fake accounts on your platform the next step is again a very interesting uh, now imagine i create an account on an online platform and i would probably provide my name and address which is ravish uh, patel and then i i stay in los angeles for example right now uh, the next step for uh, these uh, platforms is to figure out that is there a real ravish patel uh, staying in los angeles or not or is there a ravish patel who is uh, who used to stay in belgium two years back and has moved to los angeles now right so that's the next step where you kind of try and validate if that identity exists in the real world uh, and and it matches with uh, probably one of uh, an authoritative database uh, out there uh, in in the market which could be a government database which could be a carrier database it could be a utility database uh, but but that's uh, again a very important step now uh the next step is obviously something that you spoke about uh, being able to authenticate that this identity is being accessed from uh, something that the user has with him which is a device a phone number that the user has right and and that is what uh, telesign has been uh, helping our customers with uh, for the last uh, 10 to 15 years by being able to verify the users using their phone numbers but there are Uh, other ways uh, that that uh, could be solved as well the most simpler way is to authenticate users using username and password but as we all know that's not a good user experience and uh, it's it's uh, something uh, that is quite outdated now now um while some of these the, the initial three steps that i mentioned uh, are uh, useful uh, and and many of the web properties are kind of doing that in an incremental way uh, depending on the resources that they have there's a new challenge that has come out in the market uh, and and which kind of defies the purpose of uh, verifying the users uh, with with the various databases that are available as you know there have been plenty of data breaches that have been happening for the last 5 uh, years right so basically most of our identity is uh, lost uh, to these fraudsters it's available to these fraudsters and then uh, um these fraudsters can use that information in order to create accounts and and they would seem genuine in that case right uh that's where uh, the notion of dynamic uh, risk based assessment is coming up more and more with our customers asking us for that where uh, the the um the fact that identity is static is is no more the case identity is becoming much more dynamic and and we should be able to help verify that uh, so from uh, where does that particular uh, identity is getting uh, from where does that identity is Uh, is getting access is it from the same location uh, is it coming from uh, let's say an ip of uh, russia is it coming from a phone number in russia or ukraine for example how how fast is that identity being accessed from multiple platforms etc right so uh, uh, basically identity assessment should not be looked at uh, from a static uh, assessment perspective and then more and more dynamic features are required in order to uh, see the behavioral changes that are happening around identity and validate that Yeah, so it sounds like it sounds like onboarding uh is pretty complicated um from what you just went through four different steps all of which are you know pretty um uh pretty they take a lot of knowledge right to actually do them correctly. So let's really break down what are some of the things that are making um the onboarding process besides what you just went through but in more you know in a deeper detail for the for the company itself what is making this so complicated and what are some of the things that companies really need to think through when it comes to bringing on new users sure so apart from uh, the fraud issues that we talked about there are other market uh, influences that are uh, kind of this um uh, let's say that influences the decision of of your uh, processor on digital onboarding right so 
fraud, of course, is huge. It's uh, it's growing up and and it's con it's going to continue to grow up as well. So you, you need to kind of focus on that. But there are other challenges. So for example, digital divide, uh, uh, especially for companies that are trying to onboard the next billion users from developing markets, uh, APAC, uh, Africa, Middle East, for example, or South, or Latin America. Almost uh, 1.5 billion millennials or or uh, three plus billion users. They do not. They, they are accessing basically some of these services for the first time, which means there are no verifiable databases out there in the world through which you can verify, okay, this user which we are seeing for the first time ever existed in the real world. And, and that is a big uh, data problem uh, or uh, for most of the identity um, uh, managers out there. I mean, they are seeing the users for the first time and, and how do you verify those users? Then uh, along with fraud, uh, there are many regulatory changes that are happening in the market. So one of the major changes, for example, in EU is uh, around PSD2, which incidentally got uh, delayed by six months uh, this year, but uh, it is going to happen where uh, uh, basically PSD2 mandates that um, every transaction that is happening um, uh, on, on uh, uh, let's say online uh, platforms, uh, which is about $20, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they are supposed to go through a strong customer authentication process. Uh, so which means there are added burdens uh, that, that you have from the regulatory, which, uh, which kind of affects uh, and, and impacts your uh, uh, processes and then you have to take care of them. Plus, uh, as, as we speak with more and more uh, growth managers and fraud and security managers out there, they are also very concerned about privacy as well, the amount of information that they are collecting from the users during onboarding. Uh, and then what are the impacts of managing those uh, uh, so those data points that they collect from the end users? Can they keep it simple by just limiting it to a phone number or they need to uh, basically add the whole the bang of, of uh, let's say name, address and, and email and everything uh, associated as well, right? So these are some of the other market influences that uh, let's say you need to think about when you're designing or, or uh, your onboarding process at, at, at a given point of time. Then, uh, there are some strategic considerations that, that the companies have. Uh, this is depending on uh, how uh, they have decided to scale their business as well, right? So one of that is web versus mobile. So uh, imagine 10 years back, uh, WhatsApp came with a only mobile strategy to kind of uh, create uh, accounts on their platform and it worked very well from them. Uh, they had the business scale versus Skype, which was having, uh, let's say, multiple uh, ways uh, they were uh, you could access Skype uh, over a uh, over your laptop, uh, over your mobile, and 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 that that makes the process complicated as well, right? So there are certain uh, strategic choices that you make, and and uh, that also defines how your onboarding processes will be. Then growth versus fraud is a constant battle that we hear uh, from our customers. There are growth managers, there are fraud managers, and uh, they're both fighting for their KPIs. As a growth manager, especially when you are in the initial stage of raising money, for example, as a startup, you want to have more and more users uh, on your platform. Uh, and, and you limit the amount of fraudsters uh, that, that are coming on your platform, but maybe not all, right? So that's also a very important factor and geographical focus. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it's easier to manage uh, onboarding for one country. It becomes difficult to manage it for 30 countries and it becomes uh, very difficult to manage it for 200 countries, right? So these are some of the considerations that you have as well. Last but not the least, I mean, there are some operational uh, factors that you take in, uh, into consideration around user experience, localizing, uh, let's say, your onboarding process as much as possible. We've seen uh, and then we've helped our customers actually uh, also localize and, and uh, put the right language uh, on, on their onboarding forms many times. And we see there's an impact of, of the number of users going up or down based on that. Another, I think the most important factor uh, on, on this page is around scalability as well. Like you design an onboarding process, you have a supply chain behind that, you work with vendors behind that. Uh, are those vendors able to support you with the scale that is needed as well? And we've seen that with COVID happening, uh, a lot of uh, our customers from the gaming industry, remote sharing, uh, let's say remote working apps, et cetera, their businesses multiplied overnight and, and uh, we were able to support that, but there are not many vendors who are out there who could, who could manage that. And, and so this is something that, uh, again, is taken into consideration as well. Great. Thanks, Ravish. And everyone should have seen a poll pop up. If you could go ahead and just answer that poll, that would be super helpful. And then uh, we can chat about the results later. Um, okay, so we've obviously we've established that digital onboarding can be pretty difficult, pretty complex. There's a bunch of different things to think through. 
um, a lot of things to make sure that you get right. But what can we do about it? It's really good to understand a problem deeply, but we really need a solution. And with COVID going on, we need a solution sooner than later. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, I mean, ideally at the end of the day, um, if, if you are a web property, if you are a bad digital bank, et cetera, you have different choices to kind of uh, make in terms of onboarding. But what we've seen uh, that works very well is uh, helping customers uh, basically create a more very simple uh, onboarding process, uh, uh, which kind of limits the customer friction as much as possible and minimize, uh, minimizes the risks of fraud and, and compliances uh, that exist for uh, customers. And then, I mean, uh, the, you can see the snapshot of, uh, this is an example of how uh, an, a new app or a new service uh, could basically just simplify the process of onboarding by collecting just a phone number and, and, uh, and uh, uh, taking decisions based on that or verifying the users by sending out an SMS or, uh, or a voice call. Uh, I mean, while this screen looks simple, uh, obviously the processes behind are much more complex and, and there are multiple layers of assessment that uh, a company needs to kind of do. And, and this is where we help our customers a lot. So um, as I mentioned, uh, there are these four layers uh, where, where uh, companies need to kind of take care of, of what their uh, challenges are and, and manage them. We've been helping our customers uh, basically access uh, some of our services and, and uh, either combine these four layers or individually work on these four layers to help them solve their challenges around onboarding. Starting with the most basic uh, validation process. Uh, so cleansing, for example, uh, is, is a very good example for uh, validation, which is around phone numbers. Uh, I don't know if many of our audience know what is cleansing, uh, but um, cleansing is just normalization of phone number. While it sounds very easy, Doing that for 250 markets is very complex. Each and every uh, market has its own numbering plan uh, and, and that numbering plan is not static. It keeps on changing. There are new M MNOs or carriers or MVNOs that are getting added. Plus there are certain uh, dial plans that keep on changing. Uh, the way you access those dial plans from local as well as international keeps on changing as well, right? So. Uh, validating the users uh, through our cleansing or normalization process, uh, it helps our customers sometimes improve their onboarding processes by almost five to 10 per percentage in terms of converse, uh, conversions. Then you're talking about uh, helping our customers uh, verifying their identity through uh, authoritative databases with the carriers or through other sources where uh, carriers could append or get appended data or match the identity data that they're collecting from their users at a global level. Um, Third, uh, SMS and voice authentication is something that is our bread and butter. And, and uh, actually, there's a reason why 21 out of the largest 25 web properties are using us because we have a global platform, uh, direct to carrier routes, and, and uh, in our, our platform is built in for quality and reliability. And then we focus a lot on conversations at the end as well. And last, um, I think our key differentiator is being able to add the dynamic element on top of these layers, right? So. It's not restricted to static information that we can provide to our customers, but we are able to leverage all the consortium data that is flowing through our platforms, billions of transactions, and have created a risk coding solution, which is based on machine learning that takes into account various patterns that are based on usage, uh, uh, velocities, cross customer traffic. Uh, we are also able to add dynamic behavior that we could source from carriers as well. So for example, uh, Imagine uh, a SIM swap uh, event, which is like quite complex. And, and we've been noticing that on many FinTech, uh, uh, SIM swap frauds have been noticed on many FinTech accounts on the last two, three years. So getting such information and uh, allowing customers to kind of um, validate that uh, is, is uh, something that we can help with. And uh, we also are able to collect more attributes from our customers beyond phone numbers and, and uh, engage the overall digital identity through our scoring product as well. And uh, all of this uh, combined is, uh, I mean, uh, built based on our 10 to 15 years of experience of working with the largest web properties, their fraud and security management, right? So uh, this, this uh, is basically working uh, very well for our customers and, and we kind of work as a consultative partner for our customers to help them identify their challenges and solve them through these, these solutions that we have. Yeah, I think that's one of the most interesting parts of working at Telesign, right, is being able to talk to these huge clients, understand their problems, and really find solutions for them. 
Can you just very quickly, can you talk us for just a minute through the SIM swap uh, attack, just so the people listening understand? Absolutely. Uh, SIM swap is uh, actually a very dangerous attack, uh, but I mean, it's not something that is new. It has been uh, existing through the carriers for the last 10, 15 years. Basically, if you're supposed to receive a one-time password uh, from your bank to an SMS, for example, fraudsters would try and take over your phone number by uh, some social engineering methods with the carriers. And then they could receive the one-time password on your behalf. Which basically, they would uh, get a new SIM for the same phone number and then uh, try to get through as many accounts as possible uh, on, on, on your behalf. And, and uh, that could lead to a major financial loss for you or, uh, or for the concerned uh, property that they are, uh, web property that they are attacking as well. Uh, so this has been a challenge, especially for many, uh, let's say kind of applications, FinTech kind of applications or cryptocurrency applications where uh, a huge amount of money transfer is involved. Uh, and, and uh, basically, we have been trying to establish partnerships with carriers downstream, uh, not, not, in the, not only in the U.S. market, but at a global level in order to help our customers identify when SIM swaps are happening and help them take a decision, an informed decision based on that uh, before a high value transaction goes through. Yeah, that's a very important piece of data to have before a high value transaction. Um, and it really doubles down on securing that transaction with two-factor authentication. Okay, so um, along those lines, let's talk a little bit more. There's a lot of companies that have already transitioned over to using this data and using the phone number as their um, way of really locking down accounts. So let's talk about some of the results they've seen so far. Absolutely. So again, um, as I mentioned, using our solutions, we have been helping the largest, um, let's say, websites and mobile app services around the world. We are, these are some of the examples at a global level. Uh, uh, some of our largest customers are uh, coming from, uh, let's say, cloud and, and software companies. And, and uh, one of them are actually, we are helping one of them verify almost 3 billion users on an annual basis, uh, annual basis through our authentication and the scoring service a very complex customers who has users on, in almost 200 plus countries. And, and we've been helping uh, that customer scale their business for the last 10 years and, and uh, get more and more users from outside of the US market. Uh, a large ride sharing uh, giant uh, from the US market, uh, we've helped them uh, basically uh, weed out fake accounts that are being created on their platform uh, by, by helping them validate the, uh, the phone numbers and other identity elements that are uh, used in order to create those accounts on their platform. A large uh, travel marketplace uh, in uh, uh, we've helped them uh, verify users in in a market like Brazil, which is very difficult and 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 very fraudulent actually. So we're able to kind of help them verify almost eighty percent of their user base uh, through uh, our identity verification services as well. Uh, in in Europe, uh, again the the fraud scenarios are are very different than than US. So can we work with large uh, financial bureau in the UK market, which is providing their services across Europe. And then we've helped uh, them protect, uh, let's say their customers through new account fraud uh, protection and, and almost help them reduce that by more than five percentage as well. Uh, then uh, we work with a lot of uh, customers in the APAC region as well, China, India, for example, typically uh, customers that have started their business in China and now looking at scaling their business at a global level. Um, and and uh, uh, basically, they use our knowledge, uh, and and uh, uh, and then we help them. Cons we basically consult them to grow their business outside of the Chinese market. So huge numbers that come out of those applications as well. And even in in uh, far off countries in ANZ as well, we have customers who are using our identity verification solutions in order to kind of verify leads that are coming on their platform. So overall, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the problem is global, uh, and and. Uh, as a company, Telesign has been able to scale its product and services to meet the demands of our customers as well. That's awesome. Yeah, it's always fun to uh, to help stop the fraudsters, kind of like a game, right? Like figuring out how to how to stop them. Um, anyways, uh, so thank you so much, Ravish. We're going to go ahead and wrap up now um, and move over to Q and A. Don't. It looks like we went backwards here. Move over to Q&A, um, but really appreciate you uh, lending us your brain for the past uh, 25, 30 minutes. Um, that was great. So thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you both, Ravish and Stacey. That was fantastic. Um, like Stacey said, we're going to move into Q&A. We've got a few questions that came through um, during the session. 
Uh, first question is from Greg D. He asked, uh, how does voice authentication assist TeleSign in its onboarding capabilities? Sure. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we have been providing uh, SMS and voice authentication services to help customers verify uh, the phone numbers that are provided by the end users uh, when they are creating accounts on their platform. So now, uh, I mean, you can imagine when you work at a global scale, uh, uh, there are different demographics involved uh, and, and uh, different demographics would want to access their authentication methods uh, in different way. So while SMS works very well at a global scale, uh, there are certain markets uh, which are very vernacular. Uh, so for example, in, in a market like India, for example, there's uh, uh, voice works better than SMS in many cases. Uh, and, and users want to access their uh, one-time passwords over voice versus SMS. Uh, when you're talking about, uh, let's say, targeting a demographic, which is, uh, let's say, an aged demographic, about 50 to 60 years, and, and they don't want to read SMSs, that's where uh, we help our customers send out uh, one-time passwords through voice verification, uh, which is making a call and then uh, playing out an IVR in different languages, uh, multiple times that can help user uh, access their one-time passwords and uh, create an account uh, based on, on that verification method. Now, although it sounds simple, uh, in order to do that, you need to have a global network that is connected to 1,000 plus carriers and you should be able to terminate, uh, let's say, voice calls uh, in, in different markets. Uh, and, and, and that method alone is not sufficient. Uh, with voice, uh, there are other uh, vulnerabilities can come into picture. For example, uh, there are scenarios of uh, uh, revenue share frauds that happen on uh, voice verification where uh, um, let's say you could get uh, a peak of, of uh, let's say, user account creation process that is happening, and um, and, and that could lead to a bill shock uh, for for you from a, from your vendor, right? So we also help our customers protect uh, uh, themselves against such uh, uh, bill shocks or uh, revenue share frauds that are happening on their platform, and also help them identify if users are on a call forward before they are receiving a call, right? So typically. Imagine you're a bank call center and trying to call a user to verify if they, they made a thousand dollar transaction while they are traveling to UK. Uh, Fraudsters often try to kind of do a man in the middle attack by uh, putting uh, the, the phone numbers of the users uh, uh, on a call forward. And so by working with the carriers, we can also kind of help you assess uh, if um, the, the phone number is on call forward and, and you should not uh, allow that transaction to happen. Plus, uh, through our risk scoring solutions, uh, we are also helping a lot of our customers prevent uh, spam and robocalling attacks that are happening on their platform. So basically, uh, you could send in a phone number and we could let you know if that phone number has a history of robocalling or spamming uh, based on various, uh, uh, let's say, historical transactions that we have seen from that user on our platform. That's great. Uh, thank you, Ravish. We've got a couple more questions. Um, Ma I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but um, Manu J uh, has asked, how does this work on Wi-Fi when telecom operators are not able to identify the customer data? Um, that also includes dual SIM phones in different countries. Sure, yeah, so go for it. Go ahead, Stacey, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so we, we're not actually reliant on the customer being attached to, um, or, or I should say, using the data from the mobile carrier. Um, our solutions, all they need really is a telephone number, and then we can pull data directly from the carrier ourselves, right? So through our own connections directly with the telecom operators. Um, and then we also verify that the phone number is attached to the user by sending the one-time passcode, right? So it's fine if the user is on Wi-Fi, it doesn't, you know, make us any difference. Um, same thing with dual SIM phones, as long as the person can receive the text message to verify the number, we can then do lookups are, you know, on that phone number completely separated from the device itself. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to that, I mean, uh, the basic SMS and voice authentication method is uh, working irrespective of the technology, Wi-Fi or, or uh, dual SIM handsets behind. Uh, there are uh, obviously, there are alternate technologies that are available, but what our customers look for is something that is ubiquitous and, and works across uh, any country, across any kind of uh, technology, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi. 
and and that's where uh, i mean uh, it has been successful versus some other alternate technologies that might uh, have come up uh, in the recent years uh, but but they are not ubiquitous enough to be used by the customers and and ubiquity is something that our customers look for uh, when they are looking for a global solution Well, that's great. We've got another question here from Siva Samkar K. Uh, it says, how often does the identification data that is sourced from third party players get updated? Sure. Uh, I can take that uh, Shiva Shankar. Hi, Shiva Shankar. So basically, um, we would have multiple partnerships and waterfalls available uh, in order to verify, uh, let's say, users uh, to various partners that we would have downstream, including data that we have on our side. Uh, um, we typically work with a lot of carriers downstream, uh, so uh, that data is quite up to date and, and it's almost near real time in terms of uh, the, 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 the updates that are happening on their CRM platforms as well. And uh, for the remaining, I mean, we keep on doing regular testing as well as uh, ensuring that, that that data is up to date as well. Uh, now, also adding, uh, I mean, let's say a twist to your question, uh, as I mentioned, uh, identity is not static, it's very dynamic. Uh, and, and we also do other kind of checks to kind of help our customers validate that. So for example, imagine uh, that you had a prepaid phone number in the US or an Indian market and, and that got, uh, uh, you stopped using that number and then that number got recycled and resold to someone uh, uh, out there in the market. Uh, but uh, the, the accounts that were created by you using that old phone number uh, on, on various web properties are still seeing uh, you as a user for that particular phone number as well, right? So working with the carriers downstream, we are able to identify if phone numbers are getting recycled and, and accordingly we help our customers kind of keep their, uh, their database up to date as well and help them uh, avoid any kind of uh, identity integrity issues during their new account onboarding process or account takeover processes. Great. Uh, we still got a couple more minutes. We've got some more questions coming in. So I'm going to ask another. This is from someone anonymous, um, but it asks, how important is consent? Isn't that an issue if pulling my data from these sources? That's, um, that's a very good question. Uh, now, um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, um, let's say, the process around onboarding, uh, I, I, I highlighted privacy becoming a very important factor while we are designing onboarding processes for our customers, right? Uh, and that's 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 one of the reasons for that as well. As as more and more regulation regulations are coming down uh, downstream, like GDPR or CCPA, there is uh, more and more liability for uh, our customers to kind of take the right consent from their end users uh, in order to validate uh, their use, uh, validate the use of data that they have to multiple data providers, and and. Uh, Basically, we work with our customers to kind of uh, consult them uh, in order to improve their uh, privacy policies, terms and conditions to properly inform the users in different markets uh, uh, as per the regulatory environment in each of those markets and, and help them uh, access those services accordingly. So there's a, actually there's a chain of, of approval processes that we have uh, for right from the end user towards the customers to us and, and towards the uh, third party providers that we use in order to validate that properly. But, Certainly, uh, consent is very critical, and and there are other uh, important factors associated with that as well, uh, which is around. Uh, there are some legitimate purposes that are defined by GDPR, for example, and fraud prevention is one of the legitimate purposes. The reason they carve out the use of data for fraud prevention as a legitimate purpose is because they don't want fraudsters to take advantage of these consent processes as well, right? So, if uh, if if a fraudster has to give a consent, give it their consent in order to validate their data through multiple sources, obviously they are not going to allow that and they could attack your platform. So that also is a very important aspect and perspective that you need to take into account while uh, designing the overall process. Great. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of our time here. We're uh, at our 12, 11, 10, 45. Um, so thank you all so much for, for working through all this, talking about this, um, answering all these questions that we came through from the audience. I uh, appreciate the audience also submitting those questions. Uh, we do have some more upcoming events uh, in the next month. Stacy will be speaking at TAD Summit Asia on uh, May 14th. Uh, we have an international teletalk happening on May 28th. 
Uh, we also have another uh, Domestic Americas Teletalk that will be happening early June. We're still solidifying a date there, but definitely keep an eye out for invites that come for those. Uh, and thank you all so much for taking the time to meet with us today.